but that's also what reason why I want to talk to you because I read, uh, I mean, I'm not an American, so I mean, I don't have the history of, of who you are. I know you've been in the business for, for a long time and you've been doing good work for many years. So in, in America, you're like, uh, everybody knows who, who Rick Lask is. Uh, <laughs> about that, but thank you. <laughs> anyone who, who's very interested in the fire service and leadership definitely knows it. And, uh, but for me, I've been coming from the outside. I, I you know, I, I stumbled upon you late in my career, uh, and I read Pride and Ownership very late because, of course, a lot of people uh, recommended it, and it was one of those when I said the guy takes a lot of boxes. When I go like that, may, that makes sense. That just it makes sense in terms of how to look at certain problems and so on. And 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 I don't, I'm not, I don't run a. You're you're now you're a volunteer fire chief, right? Volunteer well, firefighter. Yeah. 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 You're, you're at least you're part of a volunteer organization. You try yeah, to, I'm a that. Yeah, yeah, I'm a lieutenant and a train officer for my volunteer department. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but you have a history, of course, of, of working in the fire service and, and, and so on. And I don't, I don't run a fire service. I don't have anything to do with that, but I'm an instructor. An instructor is about motivating people, at least that partially of what I need to do. And those are the course that really struck with me when you talked about motivation and ownership. And so if I, if I, if I say, because one of the things that I get all the time when I train other instructors is how, you know, our firefighters are not motivated to train, or at least not train to the extent that the instructor wants right. to do. So what are the, if, 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 if someone comes to you and say, our firefighters do not want to train, what's, what's your, what, what, what images and thoughts come to mind when someone says that? Okay, and, and I have to ask you, are we rolling right now? Are yeah, we, we're rolling, baby. Oh, we're good. I didn't even know we started. So um, <laughs> I didn't even know we started. So forgive me. I thought we were just chit chatting. No, that doesn't matter. Up. Um, you, you know, when, when I get people that come up to me and um, uh, talk about, uh, you know, the fact that the fire service has changed, and, you know, I, I guess I have issues with people that use the word culture as an excuse and generations as an excuse. You know, there, there are some cultural things that go on and there, yes, there are very much different generations out there, but we've gotten to a point where we tend to blame generations rather than mentor and train people. So I had this conversation the other day where somebody's like, well, it's a different fire service. I'm like, well, thank God it is. I mean, we'd still be on horses and throwing buckets of water through windows if we were the same. I've been doing this 45 years and yeah, the, it's a different fire service. I don't know what you're, you know. And then you get, well, these kids nowadays and these, you know, this and that. And I'm like, and I, and, and we could talk about that in a second. I take issue with people who blame the kids, especially 15, 60 year old people who are doing stupid stuff and they want to blame other generations. You know, it's kind mm -hmm. of funny how that ironic that is. But so I, I said this the other day, I said, yeah, you know, I was a little worried several years back. I was worried because everybody was into this hit it hard for the yard and nobody was going inside burning buildings and all this stuff. And firefighters don't care anymore. And they sit in the chairs. And they don't want to take care of their firehouses and their engines. And I kept hearing that, which I start thinking about, I've heard that since I started in the fire service. I've heard, I, it, it's not new talk. Um, I think a lot of people have short-term memory, you know, um, <laughs> the other part of that is, is, um, uh, Lately, I, I, I said this the other day, you can't scroll through social media um, without seeing page after page after page and site after site after site, you know, podcasters and where they're not like they're doing that, you know, they're out there, they're out there working hose lines and they're out there, you know, punching holes in ropes and doing fourth century and ventilating and all this. And all of a sudden it's, and I love it. It's this, it's this back to the hands-on grassroots. Let's get back to what we do on the fire ground kind of stuff. And because that kind of went away for a while. So I think a lot of people haven't been paying attention. I wasn't, and it just hit me. I'm like, you can't go through without seeing um, somebody, you know, doing something on fourth century or, you know, you know, whatever. Um, so I think, I think we've, we've made that curve. Everything's cyclical, right? Everything kind of spins around in circles and, you know, ebbs and flows, whatever phrase you want to use. Um, my, my biggest thing is about, about motivating firefighters. If you're going to, first of all, if you're an instructor, I taught instructor one through four for a long time. If you're going to, if you're going to read uh, from a book at a podium, if you're going to PowerPoint someone to death, we'll have a PowerPoint presentation behind us, but it's more of an aid. And I, in fact, if the projector goes out, we can keep going. You know, it's an aid. It's not, you know, PowerPoints don't teach people do. Um, when it comes to motivating firefighters, I think a lot of that is leading by example. If if you're lazy, 
if you're not into the job, if if your goal is to show up at a firehouse, a volunteer career, just sit around, hang out, and not do anything, what do you think those young firefighters are going to see when they get there? And first of all, a lot of them get frustrated because I really think they want to train, they want to do stuff, they want, you know, very few of them get in there to hang out with a bunch of buffoons or slugs. They want to be, but after a while, they kind of, I think they throw the towel in and say, well, I guess this is how it works here. And, you know, some of the best places I've been to have some of the most senior people who are into the job. You know, they're into the, you know, they're just, all right, let's go, guys. Come on, let's go. Everybody on the floor. We're going to go train. We're going to go do this. We're going to, you know, my boss, Bill Allen, had 31 years in the fire service. When I went to work for him, my lieutenant, that guy was a ball of energy night and day. <laughs> and I don't mean annoying. That He was yeah. just, you know, he was just, he, it, it was just, it was hard to not be into the job. It was hard to not be energetic. It was hard to not be motivated working for that guy, you know. Yeah. So I think a lot of that is what kind of example your senior people play in that role, you know, and, and they, they want to blame the younger generation, which we'll keep, we can talk about that in a second, <laughs> uh, rather than motivate them. Motivation is everything. You know, a buddy of mine, Eddie Buchanan, teaches a program, you know, leading with attitude. You know, passion. I have, I, I have, I have a, a part of a program talk about passion drives success. Passion drives success. Passion is the foundation for all great things, man. You know, your core values dictate how you live your life. Integrity, honor, selflessness, commitment, duty, pride, all those. But passion, if you don't love what you do, you suck at what you do. I won't even give you, you can't even be very good. You absolutely suck at what you do if you don't love it. And, there's, and, and, and if that stings someone out there, then good. Because if you if you don't love what I, I've I've never met anybody who's great at what they do. Who hates what they do? The, the people who love what they do, who are into it, do well. And that includes those that take the challenge of someone less motivated and try to pick the lock to figure out how to drag him into your camp to get him excited about the job. Long way to explain it, but that that you know that that go rat. So so is everyone like do I, and so, so, so someone in box is to open here, but is 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 everyone are there lost causes? Like like, it, it, yeah. is, it, is it valid as an instructor to say, like, it's not my problem, it's the student's problem. They don't, they're not, they're not motivated. No, I don't, I don't believe that for, you know, I used to tell people if I had a student fail, the first person I blamed was myself as the instructor. What did I do? Did I do what, what time of day was it? Was it right after lunch? Was I not motivated? Did I not sell it right? Did I miss my objectives? Was I not following the curriculum? Was I not, you know, did I get off on some monologue and, and get away from the point or whatever? When I exhausted all my instructional tool, you know, t- tools in my toolbox, then I could look at the student and say, okay, now, now we can break that into different areas too. Um, were they ordered to be there? Is it, is it mandatory? Because mandatory training is, I call it training against your will. That's always hard. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think, I think one thing that a lot of us um, kind of don't even pay attention to is there are people in the fire service, or a lot of people like, but I'll just, you know, selfishly talk about the fire service, that have learning disabilities. And when I was teaching instructor one for the University of Illinois Fire Service Institute, prior to that, if I had ever heard the names Abraham Maslow and his motivational pyramid, or Edward, uh, Edward R. Thorndike's laws of learning, how adults learn different from children, I thought I was going to like throw up in my mouth. I was like, you got to be kidding me. And then when I figured out later in life, every single human being lives their life based in accordance to Maslow's motivational pyramid. If you look at how they live their lives and prioritize, that's how it works. And then Ed, Edward L. Thorne likes law. Yep. Patterns. And if you expect like 30 students to learn identical, I think you're going to have a difficult time. And you have to know that upbringing, education, parenting, um, motivation, uh, interest, all that different thing plays into it. Um, are there throwaways out there? Yeah, there are throwaways everywhere. There are people there, you know, that you just go, you, I think you stood in line. You need to go work for Taco Bell because I don't think you should be a firefighter. And I will say that not everybody should be a firefighter, just like not everybody should be a police officer. Now you should be a school teacher. There are people that are not cut out to be school teachers that shouldn't be around teaching children and stuff. Um, but 
you know, I think we as instructors, as, as, as those, you know, that are spreading the word of mentoring have to look at ourselves first to see if we're hitting our marks, hitting all, hit, you know, checking off all the squares, if you were. And when you're out of that, you go, okay, what's next? Now you look and, you know, I always tell the story. I had a guy who couldn't read and people go, how do you get in the fire service? I said, really, do you have to really ask that question? I'm like, he couldn't read. And, and, and so, you know, on the way to work, you're always thinking about what am I going to do for training? How am I going to take care of the guys? And he was back then he was, he, he was, he was a driver and uh, he was old as dirt. He was like, he was so old. He made those scary noises when he walked and he kind of had like the white stuff around his mouth and all that. He was 44 years old. Now <laughs> that, that's a kid nowadays. That's a kid that yeah. was old back then. And every time we would do training, every time we would do something, he would, when it's exam time, test time, he would fail it and laugh. He'd throw it back, ha, ha, ha. And finally, I got dinged on one of my performance evaluations for crew professional development. And I've never had a demerit in my life. And I was, I was, I was seething. I was so upset. I'm like, you know, so I call, I call him in the office. He comes, he goes, what? And I go, what is wrong with you? He goes, what? I go, what is, you can put all the words in it. What is blank and wrong with you? What is, I'm, I, I do this, I do that, I do this. I work my ass off to train you. I do this on the way into work. I'm thinking about all this. And I just got a demerit on my eval. Me, I got one. I do, I bend over backwards to take care of you guys. And this is what you do to me. And I go, what is blank and wrong with you? And I'm much more louder than I'm saying it now. <laughs> and I look up at him and he's got tears in his eyes. And I asked people, do you know what he said? And he looked at me, he goes, I can't read. And I felt immediately about that tall. And all the red flags were there. I'm like, every all the signs were there. I was like, how did I miss this? And yeah. the reason I miss this, and I use a, 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 there's a little picture I use with this when I, I, I do it. It's actually one of our books. You know, fail, failure to hit the target is never the fault you know, you know, when you hit the target if, if, of the target, it, it, it's your aim, yeah. you know, your aim's off. I was blaming the target when my aim was, I had a guy in my firehouse with all the signs. He had signs all over him. said, I can't read, I can't read, I can't read. Yeah. And I missed it because I was too busy being a young, smart-ass punk officer. And and I asked him, I said, but Jack, you can read. He goes, you read the more? He goes, well, I read the newspaper because I can, he goes, I can read a little bit, but I can't take it from here and put it on the paper. It doesn't. Yeah. And I, and I started realizing, you know, I do. Everybody, everybody's got their weaknesses, and 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 some have learning disabilities, and I think that's part of it too. And sometimes, even in schools, there are school teachers. God bless them. I love them, but some of them can't. You know, they they used to take children with learning disabilities and send them off to hospitals and psych ward. I mean. You know, someone who yeah. had all these things that we're now realizing this is a very complex thing that even the doctors don't know everything about. So I think before we can cast someone out and say they're throwaways, you know, or they're not, you know, they're not, I think you need to exhaust everything you did as an instructor to make sure you were hitting your marks and then the individual. And after that, you know, it could be everything from a chemistry problem where the instructor is just not hitting it off with the student a motivation in there because they're all mad because their chief says they have to go to that training. They got better things to do today. Or sometimes they need to maybe, you know, consider another career option because I taught paramedic school for a long time. And once in a while, there'd be someone in paramedic school. I'm going, this is not the person I want sticking needles in my little baby girl's arm or, you know, my dad. I'm, I'm just saying some, you know, the day of let's put the drawbridge down and everybody can be everything is not really accurate. Not, you know, I think people have different niches in life and they have to find their, their places. But uh, yeah, I think, I think you got to look at yourself first and then look for other things. But I, I try to send that message a lot that people have different streaks, different strengths, different, we different weaknesses. And once you can realize and you can pick it off and then it's like, it's like you pick that lock and a whole other door opens up. And now they're engaged or whatever, because maybe they were treated, you know, so I, I, I don't like the words dumb or stupid. I don't like that. But, oh, you dumbass, you don't know this. And it's like, really? You know, and I don't do well with bullies. I don't do well with bullies and thugs in the fire at all. You know, um, I, I, I didn't like it when I was a kid and I don't like it now. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think I think there's a lot of people out there that need 
they need a little bit more um, compassion and empathy because none of us were that smart when we first started, you know, none of us were that smart. So, well, I have, I have, uh, I've had some, some bad <laughs> knowledge floating around in my head. Uh, <laughs> so for sure, you know, because you, because you said, and uh, because I, I find it to be a, a challenging, you said forced training and, and most fire departments of course have mandatory training. They say, you, you should meet these criteria for a host of reasons and, and for nothing else uh, to set an ex expectation that we want you to be good. Now, but but there's the, the, the downside of that is, like you said, like forced training could be like just just uh, um, a bad way to motivate people. Like it, it feels forced. Now, how, how do, should I think about what should be mandatory and how do I present that? like the need to do this training compared to what shouldn't be mandatory or like what it should be voluntary training just in the, in the sense of, I want to be good. Like, how do you, how do you balance that? Or how do you present that as a department or training chief? Well, there, the, first of all, there's mandates we have to deal with. So there's standards we have to adhere to and shoot for. Um, I'll, I'll use the paramedicine as a paramedic. You know, you can't pick or choose well, I'm not going to do pharmacology anymore. I'm just do cardiology. Well, no, you have to be good at all that stuff. You're out there doing patient care. The fire service, you know, I'll just pick selfishly on the fire service. There's a lot you have to know as a firefighter. I used to tease my dad. Uh, you know, he was a firefighter. You know, my dad's uh, in heaven right now. My dad uh, got me going. But I said to him, I said, what did you do in the, in the 50s and 60s in the fire service? What did you, you didn't do anything. And he's like, well, you didn't like, oh, no, you did. You didn't do hazmat. You didn't do medical and all that. There are so many areas in the fire service that we have to train our people to. The hard part, first of all, is finding the time to train, the, the, all the time to do all the stuff which you never can. Yeah. Um, but but part of that is, you know, there are, I think there are mandatory things that have to be done. And, and, and some of the mandatory is not as exciting. I think everybody should be put through a harassment class. You know, your mm -hmm. drug awareness class, dependency problem, all those, there's those mandatory ones that like the Department of Labor and people like that, they have to go through. But as a firefighter, you know, there are some classes that are electives. I guess it'd be the same thing in college. What are my electives? Well, you know, I've already been through my my f basic firefighter academy, you know, class. But you know, um, uh, Bone Gap, uh, you know, Texas has a has a, a second academy that's a little bit more advanced. You know, it's like part two to this one that we don't do. So I'm going to go do that one. You know, now the basic one was mandatory. That one, in order to be a firefighter, you, you've, you know, you have, to, there's certain things, certain, certain benchmarks you have to hit. So, you know, I think sometimes how you present it is mandatory, but the fire service as a whole has mandatory training. Every day you should be training. If you're, my, my best buddy, John Salka says that if you're not training your people every day as an officer, you're not doing your job. I don't care what day of the week it is. You should be training people every day. Um, you know, I've been to classes where guys are upset because they were, man, you know, mandated. You have it's mandatory training. Okay, you know, mandatory when you're off duty, even though you get overtime and you know you miss your side jobs, you had to rearrange daycare. I understand it, but when you show up at work, when you show up at your volunteer firehouse, or you show up, training is the backbone behind our successes. So yes, there is a difference between mandatory training and and the electives and the stuff that's just required for the job. So we, we have to have all this stuff that we have to, you just have to do to be a firefighter, period. I don't care. You can call it mandatory, volunteer, whatever. This is the stuff you need to know to be a, a firefighter. Volunteer career doesn't matter. This is what you need to know. This is what you need to be trained at. But there are some things that there's, 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 like I said, the electives that a guy's going to, he's going to go through like a tech rescue ropes class, even though his department doesn't do tech rescue or, I was big into hazmat, a big hazmat geek. So I went to anything hazmat. I went to anything hazmat. Mandatory was hazmat awareness and first responder to be a basic firefighter. So the 15 hour, eight to 15 hour hazmat awareness class and the 40 hour first responder class was mandatory. Unless you want to be a tech on a tech on a hazmat team, everything after that was, you know, elective. But there was mandatory stuff you had to go through. I think some of that's how you present it. You know, I've had, I, I use the example, good company officers 
good bosses make training fun and they make it an enjoyable outing, especially if you go out. I've had guys come up to me at a conference. They come up to get a book or something. They go, you know, chief, I got to tell you, I really don't want to be here today. I'm like, oh, okay. Thanks for that. You know? <laughs> thanks for I'm that. glad to be a service. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, no. I said, well, yeah. And they go, no, no, really? No. He goes, really? I didn't want to be here. I said, I know you said it twice already. He goes, no, I, I didn't want to be. I said, now you said it three times. Get to your point. And he goes, well, no, my captain said like two months ago, hey, this lassie guy is coming over to, you know, Bensonville and um, uh, we're going to, we're going to give uh, C shift come in early for us. You know, we're going to go have breakfast. We're going to go there, the group of us afterwards, we're going to go to TR's pub and have a sandwich and a beer and talk. And they made it enjoy. He goes, you know, and Sometimes I think how you present it, what you do, back to my Lieutenant Bill Allen. Let's go. You know, we went through a ha chemistry of hazardous materials class for 80 hours. He could have been everybody's father in the class because of his age. And he was the most motivated student, first one up at the board doing everything um, in that class. Um, so, you know, in the fire service, yeah, there's mandatory training. I think we have a pretty serious job. More importantly, we have a whole group of people out there, them, that we owe it to. We have every every citizen, every business owner we owe to be the best we can be. And to be honest, what's the minimum amount of training required for a firefighter is not enough, period. It's not enough. I don't care. Everybody says the minimum amount of training to be a firefighter is not nearly. It's not. It's like, that is, I can't tell you, that, you know what I tell people, that's why I call it the, your basic firefighter. It is about this much of this much that you have to have done. So if you're not training, if you're not motivate yourself, if you're not looking and reading, especially nowadays, nowadays there is no, nowadays you have to work so hard to not be interested in the job. We were we were talking about there are like this, there are there are podcasts like this. People could tune in to watch your stuff, watch your past archives of your shows, and listen to other your guests and to yourself and learn something. There's webinars and podcasts and seminars and conferences and YouTube videos and TikTok stuff or whatever, and and, Snap, and and Facebook and Twitter. Oh, my God, you have to actually work harder to not be interested in the job nowadays than to be interested. It's all right at your fingertips. You, we talked about the beginning, right? And you know, there, was no, there was no internet years ago. There was no, you had to get in your car and drive to go watch somebody teach. You had to actually have a magazine sent to your house to read. Now it's right here. So what what's the excuse to not be, into your profession, I don't think I don't think it's I don't buy it. You know what I'm saying? The thing is, is as a what I experienced is that we had a I would say a slump in the Swedish fire service uh, where where I thought people thought they were good. I, I th thought I I think firefighters generally they they did what was mandatory and the mandatory was very very shallow. And there wasn't any depth. So people just had the assumption that since I've done all the training required, I am perfect. I am the best firefighter alive. And therefore, I don't need to train anymore. Or at least I don't need to train hard. I can go to the lazy boy. And I, I think some of that has started, at least started, to shine through this, to at least the Swedish fire service that maybe we're not as good as we are. We think we are. <laughs> maybe there are other countries people things doing things that we don't understand or we don't agree with or maybe they even do something we like and we didn't know about it and i think that for me it was uh going back to the, like the mandatory thing is like if you set your bar so low and you don't show that that's just the minimum you're not a good firefighter when you you you, you are a you're a decent at best firefighter if you if you if you pass this if if we don't show that somehow without discouraging people like the, the uh how tall the mountain is uh i think it's very hard to get people to say oh, oh but i am already a good firefighter so why should i really dedicate myself to training and for me i mean what internet did was to show me like the depth i couldn't imagine was there in terms of all the oh, areas. You're, you're, you're exactly right. And, you know, we talk about, I actually have a PowerPoint slide that says, tell your rookie, your probationary, your proby firefighters, your new guys and gals, stay away from the know-it-alls and perfect people. Because <laughs> the day you think you're done learning is the day you need to go get a fishing boat to go do something else. Because I learned something 
This is my 45th year. I learn something about this job every single day. I read something. I watch. I go, my best buddy, John Selka, did you see this? Look at this thing. Look at this tool. Look. I just, I don't think I want to be around anybody who's not into the job or not learning or wanting to train. I, I really don't. And I definitely don't want to crawl into a burning building with them. You know, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, it's, it's, it, now look, you know, you, you get through paramedic school, um, which is incredible. And you pass it. All right. Take a couple months. Stop and smell the roses. Push a reset button. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. But you said something about we talk about raising the bar. Um, when, when I teach pride and ownership, I, when I, I used to coach my daughter's softball team, I actually painted in the locker room of the, uh, the girls locker room, softball uh, team locker room, a, a definition of pride that I've seen a lot of people use. So I'm not talking about the pride that's associated with arrogance. Yeah. Talking about the price associated with ownership, mine, yeah. my fire engine, my department, my, this is my chief, my guys, all that stuff. And this definition, which, which I love, it, it starts off with, you know, pride. It's, it's something you can't explain from the inside looking out or the outside looking in. Pride is a personal commitment. There is no such thing as proud teams, right? There are proud individuals that make up excellent teams. I'm not, I, I went to public school, you know, I'm not the best at math, but crap plus crap equals crap. All right. You give me great people. You give me people who are into the job and energy, man. You know what? The the icing, the finish line is, is that's that's that great team. That's where the pride comes from. That's the proud team to take a bunch of individuals. That's what separates excellence from mediocrity. But it's probably one of the most important parts of that definition, if you will, is it's not about competing with others because there's always going to be someone has got a newer firehouse, a newer fire engine, or whatever. The competition is with yourself. So the bar you raise is not for anyone else. See, a lot of people say we're raising the bar for others to follow. Yeah. The bar, and I, and I know this is where you were going with it. This was your point. The bar you raise is for yourself. You know, what do I have to do to be better? And, and I, I, you know, it, it's like never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. You know, it, it's it's like, the, what do I have to do to be better at what I'm doing? And I think the, if, you're, if you're constantly striving for improvement and fine tuning all that you end up with someone who's into what they do and you end up with someone who's very good at what they do i remember when i did my first uh, officer class in, in sweden i had a sort of an argument with the, with the main teacher because after the class when we had like celebration that the class was done or course was done we talked about the philosophy of he he wanted the students to leave the course uh, feeling uh, feeling that they would fix this. Like, I'm going to get out and I'm going to be a good commander. I'm going to put out fires and everything. And I said, I want them to le le uh, leave scared. Like, I need to go home and study. And, and of course, there's a balance between there. But but his philosophy, and, and that was for, for the agency that run those classes, was, and I, I couldn't buy it. Like, they wanted them to feel sort of that they're ready they're done which is the opposite of what i thought i wanted i wanted to go right. there and feel uh oh this is the depth that exists if i don't go home and and study and think about it and train i'm gonna hurt someone or i'm gonna fail i'm not gonna be successful uh, and they were like, no, you can't do that because people would be discouraged and they would be scared. They will be paralyzed to action and stuff like that. How 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 do you think where you find a balance between there? Because I, I guess there at some point you will go too far and, and make scared firefighters that don't want to do anything. <laughs> you tell them all the worst possible outcomes. I, I don't I don't think, you know, and, and I think the fear behind what we do is the fact that, and it's a phrase we've used for a long time, why would you not want to train your people for a job that could kill them? Yeah. You know, I used to, a long time ago in high school, I used to make pizzas at a pizza place in Chicago. And, you know, you burn a pizza, you go make a new pizza. We, with the fire service, we have no do-overs. There are no do-overs what we do. We've got to be at our best. And you, and you don't stay at your best by staying the way you were, it, do, it doesn't work that way. You know, you've kind of constantly strive to improve what it is you're doing. The fear should be, this is a job that could kill you, man. You drop your guard one time, you do something. If that, that, the fear should be the driving force 
at times behind the motivation should be, I need to be the best I can for them. And to be honest, for my family, because I'm not going to be around long. They're going to be, there's going to be bagpipers playing. There's going to be an honor guard holding the flag. And there are going to be a bunch of people crying if I don't stay dialed in and into the job and so on and so forth. So, you know, to send people home scared and and, and afraid, I think is, I don't, I don't even, I don't, I don't think that's where we need to go. I think they need to have an awareness of how serious this profession is. Volunteer career, by the way, fire doesn't care. Fighters just say, oh, before I burn this firefighter, is he or she a volunteer career firefighter? It doesn't care. It will kill your ass dead no matter what. But the fear should be, this is a serious job. And that should that should help drive that motivation that I need to be better. But but if you get if you send a bunch of people home and they're afraid to do their jobs, you know, some that you know, we've talked about before, can you be too safe? And to be honest, I think I think that's two ways to look at that definition. One is can you be ever be too safe? Well, there are people who say no, you can never be too safe. But on the other hand, if we're if we're afraid to make decisions out of fear, that can actually trip us up and get us hurt and get us killed. You know, sure. you, you need to make decisions based on your cognitive knowledge and your psychomotor skills that you've trained and the, the information you have up here to be able to do your job. But sometimes the hesitancy, you know, there's a natural fear on, on the fire ground that your gut feeling, I think that people need to pay more attention to that. I have a bad feeling about this building that may fall down. And if you feel that way, chances are it's going to. Um, but I'll say when I was a young firefighter, there were fires I went to. I remember I went to a fire with, 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 with Todd Cervanka, my captain, and I got to the top of the stairs and I couldn't move. I had a nozzle and he kneed me so hard. He put his knee in my butt and he actually hit my, my tailboard. You ever hit that? We you hit your tailbone and you get that, you know, he hit me so hard. I flew up and I took the hose up spraying and, and, and you know, what I feared was inexperience, okay? I, it wasn't that I, you know, the inexperience allowed me to be fearful what I was doing. He knew, he'd been doing this a long time. He's like, what are you doing? Come on, let's go. And you see this in a lot of you young firefighters, a lot of the women and men out there, you can see in their eyes because this is their first fire or this is their first whatever, or, you know, and that's natural, you know, that that's natural. This is where the leaders and the mentors play a role going, come on, come with me, this is okay. And I used to say this, if my Lieutenant Bill Allen said, Rick, we're going to walk through that wall of fire and on the other side, we're going to put a fire out and we're going to come back. I, when I first went to work, I go, you're out of your mind. And I worked with him for a short time. I'm like, let's go. Anywhere that guy told me we were going to go, I went. That's how much confidence I had in him because he had that experience. So I think there's a natural fear of gut feeling that helps good incident commanders or people make good sound decisions. But sending people home scared or afraid I think there needs to be a heightened awareness of how serious this job is, if you want to call, I'm replacing the word fear with that. Um, but, but you know, like I said, to be, the little bit of fear you should have is that, you know, if I don't pay attention on a highway, I'm going to get run over. If I don't pay attention to fire, or I do stupid stuff or, uh, you know, I'm freelancer, I'm not paying attention to my bosses and stuff like that. And I not only jeopardize my life, but the people that work with me, you know, there should be a little bit of fear of, this is pretty serious stuff. I think those in the military, you know, my son served in Afghanistan. I know there was a certain level of fear there. There are people that want to shoot bullets at you. There are people that want to blow you up. And when you drop your guard, you know, you see it with law enforcement. You see a lot of videos. I'm very partial. I love my law enforcement family. My wife's in it. You see the videos. You see it coming. Police officer gets out of the patrol car. They're walking up. They don't, they don't approach it the right way. They don't check the trunk. They, they just walk a screw up in the wind and the guy shoots them. And you go, well, I saw that coming. You know, they let their guard down. And I always take complacency is just a fancy word for laziness. So there needs to be a little bit of fear that this job could kill you. But that should push you to want to be better at what you're doing and be better trained. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, like you said, I think the fear, like for me, what my fears, like, like I, when I do acquired structure burns, um, I realized that people were so confident in my abilities that it offsets their judgment. Like they, 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 
they trust me so much that I should tell them when it doesn't feel right or it isn't right. And it's very hard for me, just, just an example, like when we were sitting inside a car structure burn, depending on where the flows are from the fire, the temperature difference is, is hum huge. I can be sitting in a place closest to the fire, but still not anywhere close to the amount of heat and energy hitting someone else. And I may get mis misjudgment of where that energy would go and so on. So I could be sitting there and going, and people go, I hope Lars is going to go out soon and do something because this doesn't feel good. And they wait right. too long. It doesn't really matter. And it, even if I really tell them in advance, like, th I, I have this problem. Don't trust me. <laughs> you know, you have to be your own. If it gets too hot, go out, say something, do something. And you still end up in those situa situations. And I, so my fear has, has, of course, changed from um, to, to, to making errors. I mean, being, being the fear of not knowing or not, anticipating what others will do what the fire will right. do what the building will do and it's a it's a constant i would i don't use fear is, is like you said it's, it's a it's a sort of it, it's somewhat a bad word it's it's but if i use the fear of failure instead of fear of dying it, it, it is a better word uh right and i i want to find that towards other because complacence like you said complacency is is lazy lazy is one word to use for it but the other one is just I think I'm good enough to handle what what's out there. Like I, complacency comes from I think I'm good enough, and, and that's the, the I think that's what one of the real dangers of I say where and maybe somewhat the Swedish fire service, for instance, are in that there's too many who think they're good, and that forms a, a complacency of well, nothing bad could happen. We don't have, we generally, Swedish fire service haven't had a dead firefighter in the fire for, I don't know, 15 years. Uh, and that, like, so statistics and the general think, thinking is, oh, but we're good enough. We're we're really good. So that's that's why we aren't killing firefighters. And I just go like, yeah, I, I don't feel that when, I'm, when, I, when I do training a lot of times. Like, people do really bad things. And, and, so I want to have, I want to create that sense of urgency or respect or fear of failure without, of course, creating uh, a fear of of acting, like like you said, that that that's equally bad. Or I don't want to be a risk aver adversive fire service. I want to be risk management fire service. That that is the goal. We should manage risk, and you know, like and we. We shouldn't be adverse to taking risk. We should take, you know, calculate risk. We should be really good at managing risk. Uh, I love like how Mike Rowe says it in safety third sort of principle that, I mean, if you're just good, you're going to be safe. Like it, it's just, if you don't know something, you need very strict rules. Don't do this. I don't really understand why, but don't do it. Uh, and and it, But it's hard to find that balance uh, when people say, uh, well, I don't want to, I don't want to tell people they're bad because it will, some of them will get sad. <laughs> it's, a, it's a constant problem. I, I like, I remember when I, when I, when I quit as a incident commander, I work with training full time. And I remember one of the last things we did was I tried to measure, I, I just tried to measure some knowledge, like very simple, like do a test of the firefighters in the region. What do they know about this subject? Not create a minimum requirement that they had to pass a certain level. So it was just a check because I couldn't, I could make a requirement out of it because then it would be tied to if enough people fail, does that mean it's going to cost money to train? And we don't have any money, or we're going to spend the money, or does it mean that we can't even go to those alarms? Maybe we should have canceled truck blocks. We can't go out in certain calls because our competency is not high enough. Um, but it ended, ended up that I couldn't even do the test because the fire chiefs were so scared of the outcome of the test because either someone would get so sad because they were the last one in a row of 700 <laughs> or it might bite them in the ass afterwards because of 
oh, you did this test and you did nothing to to correct it, and now someone got hurt, and like, why didn't do anything? So it's better to put your hand in the sand. And I I was very frustrated, and and was it was part of the reason I left that kind of culture, that it's super prevalent at least in the Swedish fire service. Like, put your head in the sand and hope for the best. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I've I've joked for years that the. Uh... In, in America, the the number one injury to firefighters is hurt feelings. Um, <laughs> you know, they they get butt hurt over things. They want to use their favorite tool or their favorite tactic or whatever. Um, I used to be that way when I was young. I you know, I was a young kid. I used to do that. Um, but I had great mentors that taught me to keep an open mind and to keep reaching for the next level. And to you know, there, there are things that we don't need to change in a fire service. There are things that worked for a couple hundred years that work still today just fine. Um, but I go back to, I'm a big history buff. Uh, I love teaching the history of the fire service. And if you go back in time, yeah, we, we you know, in the States, when, you know, Ben Franklin created the first volunteer fire department in 1736, which they weren't actually fighting fires back then, but they're more insurance patrolmen or fire patrolmen. But, um, that being said, you know, look at how the fire service evolved. You know, um, you know, we have paramedics sticking needles into people's bones to start IVs. Well, look at the technology into fire engines now and ladder trucks. Look at the, uh, the, the technology into our turnout gear, you know, our PPE, our, our, the thermal imaging, the tools, the nozzles, the pump handle, this stuff, how we get alerted in our fire state, everything. I mean, how can you, how can you not say that the fire service hasn't progressed you know, you know, the, the, the armed forces have always been quicker with, with the technology and have had it longer and made it, you know, hard for us to get, you know, but we eventually we get it. There's some pretty incredible things going on out there right now. Um, but, to, you know, to to uh, to kind of, like you say, bury your head in the sand is an accident waiting to happen. Um, you know, a mentor of mine who's passed on, uh, General, uh, former Secretary of State, General Colin Powell, one of his great statements from his book, um, It Worked for Me, is never walk past a mistake. And you can apply that to anything. Never, you know, you, if you walk past the fire engine and the hose bed's all screwed up and you don't say nothing to your guys, then shame on you. You know, you should, what, what is this? Well, we, we reload, you know, you, two hours ago we're on the high. Okay, come on, let's go. Let's get it. Fix it up. This is not us. You know, when you hold your people, you I, I tell people you can't choose what you can be great at. You can't say, well, we're going to be great at fighting fires and we're going to suck at EMS because I don't like EMS. You know what? Then you suck. You know, you you uh, either strive to be great at everything, you know, or you're not at all, you know. So, but bear, yeah, you're right. You, you bury your head in the sand. You're going to be going to funerals in our business. Uh, or you're going to be answering to families going, I thought you guys were better than this. You know, the public spends a lot of money on us and apparatus and equipment and stuff and everything else. And we owe them something. We owe them you know, a performance that's not just mediocre. How do you think you should handle, what's the right way to handle the risk? Like when you, when you measure something, you the risk, or you, when you reward someone for doing something good, you also not reward someone else. If you measure someone, there's someone's going to be at the top and someone's going to be at the bottom. How do you handle, I mean, the ones who end up in the top, they're always happy, of course, because they're probably, probably competitive to start with and they're happy to get recognition, whatever recognition is. But how do you handle the bottom? How do you handle those who are disappointed or feel unfairly treated or exposed to their ignorance or lack of skills? Well, I, I think, you know what, part of being an adult is realizing that, you know, uh, there's times we succeed, there's times we fail. And uh, be, I, I, I've said for a long time, you want to see the true measure of a person. Don't promote them or discipline them. You know, if you have to discipline someone, and I've, I have guys that I know, I have firefighters that work for other fire departments now that till this day are still angry at me because I had to discipline them for something they did wrong. And I go like, I didn't do it. You know, why you're, you're mad at me because you did something wrong. Or maybe, you know, you didn't get promoted. You know what? For whatever happened, chemistry, whatever, you, you know what? You didn't, you didn't, maybe you didn't study hard. Maybe this person just scored, you know, that kind of stuff. So part of that's being an adult. You want to be an adult. You want to be America's, you know, here in the States, America's heroes and be a firefighter. And little kids look up to you. And part of that's taken with it a little bit of fire service maturity where you go, I've had plenty of my mentors stomp on me, stomp, stomp on me. 
and give me the give me a, a butt chewing that was so deliberate and so straightforward that it made my ears real hot. And I felt like I was going to cry. And I, I was never, maybe I was raised there, but I was never uh, mad or angry with them. I was more angry with myself because I didn't want I, I felt like I let them down. I never want to disappoint my boss. So it's easy to reward the people that do a great job, you know, and pat them on the back and high five and fist bump and recognize them because you know, who doesn't want to be recognized for doing a great job or doing a good job at something? The challenge as a leader, as a as a mentor, um, as an instructor is how do you address, how do you motivate those that are that are either substandard or not hitting their mark? And it goes back to what I said before. What's the reason? I, you know, I, I've had a lot of people in the fire service, I won't say a lot, but those really big, if you want to call them, we used to be able to call them problem children. Now we have to call them leadership challenge. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, those leadership challenges, I'll tell you, the majority of the ones that I've dealt with, their attitude, their negative attitude, their bad attitude, whatever, had nothing to do with the fire service. When you really got back and you go, why do you hate being here? Why are you so angry? You end up finding out that there's stuff going on at home, stuff going on in their personal life, whatever. That's a fa- and, they, and they're blaming us or using us as that instrument. You know, we're the whipping post, if you will, that thing. Um, so, again, you know... I, I, there's a, I keep going back to like stuff from the class we teach where I'm like, you know, not everybody's going to get it. And you have to, you know, you have to remember that, that those who don't get it are not bad people. There's something going on in their life. That's not allowing it to sink right now. Um, I had a hard time as a young firefighter grasping that not everybody loved the job of being a firefighter like I did. How could you not love this? It's just a job to some people. And those are the people that didn't care or whatever. Um, Attitude is everything. Motivation backs that up. Good mentors, but um, those that that are not performing, you know, there has to be a means of sitting down and it's called coaching and counseling and, and talking through. You don't berate them in front of people. You don't harass or humiliate them. You don't tease them. Um, you know, you don't go, hey, meet me in the office in 10 minutes in front of everybody because then everybody knows what you're going to talk about. You know, you pick a time and you sit down and you go, look, we've got to work on this. We've got to talk about this. You know, or what I saw out there performance wise is an first of all is inappropriate or it's not what we do. And I like to appeal to the competitiveness of firefighters. I like no, I don't I've never I've really even some of the I've never met a firefighter who wants to be who wants to work with the buffoons and wants to be looked at as oh here they come. They're the ones that wear the company logo t shirts that say we suck less. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I, I, I really, you know, I like to appeal to that part of it of, you know, and help them figure out where it's, where, where they need to go to be better. But when you walk past a mistake, whether it's the hose bed or a, a firefighter, a leadership challenge, you it festers and it becomes a bigger problem. And the good boy, I do a class called great leaders make difficult decisions. It's just like it's, it's easy to commend the person that did a good job. It's easy to make the easy decisions that make everybody happy. But every two things every great leader I've ever studied or ever worked for or been around have done. Number one, they value family. Every one of the great leaders I've ever been around values family. And they have they have no problem making the difficult decisions. You know, having that difficult conversation. I hear that a lot. Oh, my chief's great. I, we love our chief, but you know. He just, he just can't, he doesn't know how to have that, that difficult discussion that he, so what happens is, you know, things fester and and problems continue. And then the nice guy, you know, one of my mentors, Chief Al Brunacini used to say, if you want to, if you want to, you want to make everybody happy, go sell ice cream. Everybody loves ice cream. (laughs) Okay. But if you want to be everybody's buddy, you're in the wrong business as a boss or a leader. You've got to be a leader. You've got to be a boss. You've got to be the person that, you know, is looking for the final outcome. So once in a while, you're going to have to have that hard conversation with someone, but you don't berate someone. You don't beat them down. You don't, you know, some people it's like, I don't know if they lived in a home or their dad, you know, harassed them or beat on them, but that's not how you get people. People think that if I harass you, beat you down, you're going to learn. That doesn't work. It, you know, bullies don't, bullies are not good teachers. The people who are good at thinking about and figuring out, I, I say this a lot. One of the things we say we're good at is size up. 
you're know, talking about house burns and stuff, quiet structure, size up. We're good at size up, you know. We actually suck at size up. I love the fire service, but we suck at we suck. We don't we don't understand building construction, we don't understand fire behavior. We misread buildings of smoke and the building kills us, not the fire. We misread all this stuff all the time. What we really suck at is misreading people. You know, we misread people and that every say if you have you line 30 firefighters up, every single one of them has a different background, a different look. You cannot paint with a broad look at them. You could put all the same uniforms on them. They're all different people in that uniform. And it goes back to, you know, what we're talking about not hitting your mark. You have you have to be willing to have that hard conversation with someone, but you can't just have the hard conversation and not provide them with a, an avenue to fix it, you, right? It's like people that talk about doing critiques after a fire. I used to, I, I stopped calling them critiques. I'd call them go back overs because you call it a critique and everybody wants to beat each other up and that's what I want to do. And you did this wrong. So I say, hey, we're going to, let's get together. We're, we're going to go back over that fire we just had. And the first thing I talk about is all the positives, right? Let's talk about all the good things. Okay, guys, it was a great job, man. You did this, this. And, and you go, engine two, what happened? And they're going to tell you. They go, all right, that's us. And you're going to get to this. We dropped the supply right and wrong. Or wrong. It got hooked. It got wedged underneath the pickup truck's tire and all that stuff. They'll, they'll tell you. But just like mentoring or working with that leadership challenge, if all you do is pound them out the negative, that's all they're going to it's gonna, it's gonna be that. And they're, you know, you've got to, I think you've got to give them an outcome. You've got to give them, you've got to provide them with the, the pavers, the, the stones for them to get here. If you do this and beat on with this and then say, okay, now let's talk about how to fix this. Let's talk about how to make this better. But I think a lot of people leave that part, the most important part out. They get in there and they tell them all that they did wrong, but they don't tell them how to make it right. You know, I think some guys and gals are just looking for that answer. They're like, okay, well, so what am I, you know, like, then tell me what I'm supposed to do. Oh, oh that's right. I'm supposed to tell you, you know, it. yeah, that kind of stuff. So. And I think I, I think I am personally in the process of um, coming more empath empathic. Is that the word? Right word compassionate. Yeah, <laughs> in, well, the, in the fact, sense, yeah, empathy. Uh, empathy. You're right. Yeah. Empathy has a big deal with it. Yes. Yeah, in, in a sense, because as an instructor, of course, I think, and I think most instructors pass that point where they they are frustrated with others not being as passionate that they are, so they blame others for which is, of course, partially true for not being into the job as much. And then also, I find myself at that having, just like internet today, where you take the most unfavorable approach to your competitor's argument. You you, you pick the raisins out of the, to the, the cake and try, not trying to find middle ground uh, and not trying to steel man the other people's argument. That's the point. And I think I, I, I'm very much guilty of not trying to understand why some people are hesitant of buying an idea, uh, of course, and trying to be more compassionate about trying to understand where they're coming from, even if it's stupid. You're using the word as ignorant, not stupid as in low IQ. They're like, that doesn't make any sense, but I will try to understand you uh, better. Well, and, and then one of my mentors used to use the phrase, I don't have to be wrong for you to be right. And the other way around, yeah. we can agree yeah. to disagree. Yeah. But, you know, when people say some of the best leaders I've worked for were approachable. Well, yeah, but there's a part two to that. Everybody's approachable, but are you open minded? Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there are people that do this and go and and it's it's in here and out here, you know, approachable it has to be connected, open minded. Just like you said, if we're not going to listen some of our greatest ideas have come from some of our newest firefighters. I use this example in a class. Um, I get a knock on my office door. A young firefighter comes in and says, what is captain? Chief, do you have a second? Sure, what's up? He goes, well, Chief Cunningham, yeah, Cunningham said we can come in and talk to you. I'm like, okay, what's up? He says, you're a big history buff. Why are, there, why are most attack lines, hose lines, 50-foot lengths? Why, why those 50-foot couplings? And I went, There is some history behind it, but I don't know why. He goes, well, he goes, it seems like the first set of couplings always get hung up. He says, it's more at the house fire. I'm healing the hose for Tommy and the captain, and they yell for more hose. And what happened was the coupling, those little boot scrapers, people, those people next to their stoops, they had one right next to the stoop. 
and the, the 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 coupling slipped off the stoop and it fell behind the and it got locked right and he's pulling and pulling they're yelling at him I'm trying he goes it seems like the first set of couplings get hung up all the time what if we got rid of those and I looked at Tim God rest him I loved him Tim Tim I looked at Tim my op chief and he goes well I guess I'm fixing order me some hundred foot lengths so we ordered so so you know for the longest time I think it's still that way from the nozzle back the first hundred feet of an inch and three quarter attack line whether it's the cross lay or a skid line they're not 250s it's one 100 foot length we got rid of the first set of couplings guess what doesn't get hung up anymore <laughs> and that all came from a brand new firefighter's idea where some boss would say oh, you can get out of my office don't you come in and tell me you you're, you're, you just started here rook get out of here boots and they, you know, they don't listen. And some of our best ideas that come from some of our newest people. Sometimes you go, good idea, and ain't gonna work. Thank you. But that that's one idea that came from a brand new firefighter. If you're willing to listen to them, and like you said, keep an open mind. It was part. It was part of the reason I quit um, working full time. Not I do most uh, just instructing. Uh, working full time was I. I remember I had an experience with a with a with a very good instructor. But he had an annoying he had an annoying issue where he interrupted my questions before I've asked them because he sort of knew already what I was gonna ask. You've heard that question a million times. And I find it really annoying, both when he got it right, but also when he didn't get it right. So he answered something else I didn't want. Now the history goes that I was sitting in my office as a training chief and responsible for like development and so on, and there was there was new firefighters coming in with ideas they wanted to do. And I found myself not having the patience to listen to them properly. So I, I recognize I have a problem. I either become the person who I don't want to be, which I myself found to be highly annoying and very dis, dis made me very angry or, or at least feel very unappreciated, or I change. And at that time, I realized I don't have the energy to change because I had so much on my plate. So I, I quit instead, which, I, which I, I at least found some pride in recognizing my failures and, and not becoming that. But it, that, was, that was a big issue. I didn't have, it takes a lot of effort to listen to something oh. or someone you think is wrong and it's a waste of time. It, it it, it takes a lot of effort to listen. You just hit on something that we talk about again in class a lot is listening is hard. Yeah. And I ask people, you ever been through a, a listening exercise where you're you're reading something to me and I have to pick out key components and re, repeat it. And after about five minutes, it's like somebody took an ice pick and they stuck it through <laughs> your ear and poking out your eye. Because yeah. yeah. listening's hard. It's, yeah. it's, you know, and it's like, so, take it to the radio. Before you key up your radio, listen and see if anybody else is talking. And before and before you key up, if they're calling someone else, then know that someone else is going to answer them. Don't you know? It's the same thing. Is is listening to people, you know, the whole communication definition definition communication, right? Is a given exchange of gestures, noises, words, blah blah blah, all that stuff. And right now we're doing it: the sender, meaning, and receiver. You know, I say something, you just nod it. I already, you just communicate, and it, it's constant back and forth. Um, you know what? <laughs> There are some people. My dad, God bless my dad. Used to that. I'd be saying stuff, and he'd be going because uh, 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 he he wanted to. And I'm like, he was ready to just jump in there instead yeah. of just go. Okay, you know, not having a conversation sometimes means you go back and forth. You go, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, yeah. talk. But but in the in the in the teacher student atmosphere, you know. Sometimes we miss because we, you know, that's. I, you ever have had somebody talking about something and they interrupt you and you go, and they give you an answer. You go, okay, that's good, but that's not what I was asking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's good. Thank you for that. I'll put that over here. But I was asking about this yeah. because they didn't listen. Well, I think I think that was the, the realization. I was going. If I don't listen to them, they will feel they will they will notice that I don't really listen. Uh, if I interrupt them because I think it's a waste of time, they will, of course, all again feel unimportant. They will be demotivated, and I, for myself, of course, I risk of not hearing the things I needed to hear to challenge my own beliefs and everything. So, 
but again it, it took it took a lot of effort to be that kind of active listener i didn't i was too young I still i i didn't have that patience i think i'm a bit more patient now i'm still working on it <laughs> to have that patience um but also the compassionate side now, i i did it to, to to be frank i did it from a system perspective i don't know i can't have this position in the system because i will be a weak link I didn't necessarily do it out of compassion for them as an individual. Um, I think that also is a bit of a change that that if if they are passionate enough or interested enough to come up and say, I have an idea, I want to change something, uh, that should be highly valued on an individual level as well as a systematic level. Even if they're... Even if they're uh, idea is proven uh, proved to be wrong like that drive they're providing is important even if it's momentarily is going in the wrong direction <laughs> right if, if that makes sense uh and i think that was uh that i, I think that was um, a realization i, I try to as an instructor i have less um ability to affect things um i'm not i'm not an uh, in charge of hiring i'm not in charge of and right now I, I don't even choose who goes to one of my classes or courses i just i'm just there for a limited amount of time so what i can what i can really affect is what people say and how engaged they are right now that's the only thing i can really really affect i can't change what happened before i can't change what happened afterwards but that really makes me want to understand more how to uh, make them more motivated right now. And I think that one of the things I'm getting better at is finding that when people say something, uh, really value it almost regardless of what they say. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great point. Great point. And listen, like I said, if you're not going to listen to your people, you're not going to, I mean, again, yeah, I think you end up traveling on a path where you, you realize that there are a lot of other people in your life that were right. There are a lot of other people mm -hmm. that had great information. Um, you know, um, uh, you, help, you can take it to the fire ground, you know, and if you're not going to listen to what people are saying, uh, there's a lot of chiefs that have marched off the pier right into the ocean <laughs> that didn't listen to what their, 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 their teammates, their command staff, whatever, their people in those roles were telling them, and uh, they just kept, they just kept walking instead of saying, stop for a second, back up, let's move over and, and do this. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. So what do you, who do you think is the most important formal position in the fire service to create that sense of motivation or drive or passion? I think it's the company officer, the lieutenant or captain, um, you know, senior firefighters, and you can have five years in your fire department be the senior firefighter. That, you don't have to have 30 years on the yeah. job. But, you know, the chiefs, God bless them. The chiefs are, uh, you know, they're up there with the strings, the little puppeteers and all stuff. <laughs> but we talk about the company officer is the linchpin. The company officer has their firefighters, his or her firefighters, and they have their chiefs. The company officer, lieutenant uh, captain, sets the tempo for the firehouse. You know, most places, most places, there's not a fire chief right in the front seat telling you, slow down, put your seatbelt on, get it back, or we're in too far, get your face piece on, put your face piece back on, whatever. It's the company officer. It's the company officer. When they show up on drill night at their volunteer fire department, it's going, okay, let's go. Everybody, let's go. Training time. It's the company officer that's going, you know, not ruling, you know, hitting them, you know, with the sledgehammers over the head, stuff like that, but... The boss, the motivator, I talk about this. You can always spot a rodeo guy. You can always spot a rodeo guy on the airplane because their left arm is kind of bent. Their hand is from holding on to the horn and, and wrapping that rope around it. You should always spot the good company officers. Their, their hand is kind of bent because they have it on the crank on the morale siren. <laughs> and, and your job is to crank. Sometimes you have to crank the shit out of that to just, you know, to, because you don't bitch down to your people. I don't care what's going on up here. You're the one, nobody gets in their car, drives up to their firehouse and goes, God, I hope my lieutenant captain just bitches and complains the whole time I'm there. Yeah. They don't do that, you know? You know, so I think the person that has the best opportunity to motivate, to 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 set the tempo and all that is absolutely that lieutenant or captain of the firehouse. 
I'm not the fire. Your firefighters are the hardest working people in the firehouse, by the way. The firefighters are the hardest working. Those men and women are the hardest working people in the, in the, in the firehouse. But the lieutenants, the captains, the company officers, they set the tempo. That's that's where it happens. That's where the motivation comes from. That's where the turn around, grab, you know, that's the person that grabs a hold of you. That's the person that says, come on, let's go. That's where it says, follow me. You know, all those different things. God bless the chiefs, but I think the answer there is the company officer. So if you, if you uh, besides actually recruiting the right people, what are, do you think that the most important things to do as chiefs or the chief to create that kind of company officers? Well, one is I think you need to lead by example. You can't be a, a shitbird chief and expect people behind you. You know, you've got to give them something to model after, something to copy, something, you know, you know, when they have nothing else but themselves to model after, they stumble. So you've got to get, you've, first of all, you've got to do that. Give them something positive to draft off of. Number two, you got to train them. The fire service is the only profession in the world where we front load you as a firefighter. We put you through the fire cam, we put you through hazmat, we put you through EMS stuff, we put you, put you, put you, put you, put you. And then we promote you up through the ranks with literally no training. That's why John and I do the company officer academy and the battalion chief academy because I got screwed. Unlike New York City where you make lieutenant, you go away to school for six weeks. My my chief says, hey, buy your guy steaks. You're moving. You're a captain. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Isn't there like a book that goes with it? And you see that. I mean, you ask firefighters or ask officers how much training before you're ever allowed to ride the front seat in that pump or that ladder truck. What class did they set you on how to be a company officer, how to plan, organize your day, how to coach and counsel, how to organize the camp, how to do performance evaluations, how to discipline, how to do this. And they all start laughing. They go, nothing. I'm like, that's kind of scary. And what's even scarier than that is put chief in a title. Battalion, yeah. deputy, district, district, uh, uh, division, chief of department. The men and women run the whole joint receive the least amount of training. So I think in order to, if we create a better pool of firefighters and give them the stuff they need to do, will create a better uh, you know, pool of company officers and eventually better chiefs. But you can't do that by just giving all the training here and nothing here. And that's what we do. So I think we have to provide them with the tools and the instruments to help them deal with their firefighters and motivate their firefighters and lead their firefighters and coach and counsel their firefighters and set that tempo, um, you know, there. You've got to have a good process, you know, as, otherwise – we're just, we, we've done it. We've promoted people up through the ranks who suck, you know. Um, but I, you know, plus as a boss, you got to be willing to say, look, you know what? I, I had a group, I had some captains once that were just miserable and upset and angry and hated each other. I said, this ain't going to happen anymore. Not going to happen anymore. If you, if you, th if you guys can't figure this out, I'll find me new captains. This is not going to happen anymore. You know, they're all looking at you. They're all laughing at you. People outside are laughing at you. Stop it. I can't work this way. I'm way too competitive to have a bunch of yutzes ride in the front seat. So sometimes those demands as a boss need to be, you know what, expect them to be good. You know what, I'm expecting you to be a good boss. I'm expecting you to motivate your people. You know, blind faith means you're out there doing this job. You know, I don't care if you don't like me or not. It has nothing to do with it. <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. It has to do with what you're doing to motivate your people. So I think we can get that done. Yeah, it brings me to mind when, when when from Saving Pride Brian when Tom Hanks the the captain says they're walking about and they're they're they're, they're noticing that he never bitches and he, That's right. he he makes a speech you go like I bitch up I bitch up you, you know I never bitch down. He says, we use that I use that video clip and I oh you do <laughs> well, yeah my complaints don't go down my complaints go up well oh. what would you say if if the Colonel, I would say well Colonel sir I think the Saving Private <laughs> Ryan is is the our goal I mean you don't. If you're a yeah. boss and you bitch down, you're the problem. You're the problem. Yeah. The guys don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. They're going to laugh. Oh, 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 oh. Is he done yet? They don't want to hear it. They don't want – nobody goes to the firehouse to hear their boss bitch about the chief or the mayor or whoever. You know, stop it. They don't want to hear it, you know. That makes sense. So so is, if, the, if the company officer is the most important and, and, and we have the division chief, of course, trying to model – trying to create some kind of model for them to, to, to follow um, – where do you, where do you, where do division chiefs and fire chiefs? How do you create those kind of models? Like, what are the, what are the tips and tricks for for creating basically mentors for others to follow? Is that? Well, you know, people talk about. You've heard the phrase, 
you know, leaders are born. Not, you know, I don't believe that. I believe there's a lot of people that have something, a chemistry inside of them that you have to figure out to develop them. I think everybody, some people are not cut out to be bosses and some people are not cut out to be, like I said, not some people shouldn't be doctors. But I think there's a lot of talents people have within them that you have to find and expose. Um, that that being said, um, uh, when, when it comes to, you know, setting them up and giving them the tools to be successful, I think expectations is where it all starts. You know, we do a whole part of our company officer academy where we have, it's a section called your new company officer, the role of the chief. And that's where you sit down with that new company officer and say, okay, let's talk about what's expected. And you run through this laundry list of expectations for them. You know, that's something, you know, it's hard to go back and deal with the problem child slash leadership challenge if they don't know what's expected of them. You know, if you just, if they just showed up, okay, you're riding behind him today. You know, if you don't sit down and say, this is what I expect. I expect you to show up early. I expect you to be ready to go when the bell hits. I expect you to be dressed every time. I expect your gear, your tools, your this, your that, blah, 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 blah. This is what we're doing. Seatbelt down, all these different things, face be and, 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 and later on you go, I do something with it, with applicants where I say, I need to acknowledge this because we're going to make a note and put it in your file. If you lie or you steal just one time here, you'll be fired. Dishonesty is a terminating offense. If you lie or you steal, you're done with that. So acknowledge that right now. So you get it. Okay, write it down, note it. So later on, if you do it, I don't want you to go, but I did know because I've heard that doing consulting work. Well, I wasn't aware. You know what? So make them aware of, their, of, of your expectations. What do you expect? out of that company officer, that lieutenant captain, when it comes to how they're going to run their crew. Again, I see a lot of, I see a lot of holes in the paper when you go somewhere and you go, so you never sat down and explained to your firefighters what expect them on day one. And over in the, in the armed forces, they do that day one in boot camp. They, they strip you down, you have individuality, they build you back up and I believe with something special and that's their values and how they run. And they keep hitting you and hitting you until you finally go, okay, I get it. I, I embrace it. Well, that's why company officers need to be talking to their firefighters and telling them and, and making sure they understand, 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 and understand until they cave and they go, I get it. You know, and the same thing as a, as a big boss, you have to be talking to those that are out there with the troops and, and developing them and giving them the tools and the confidence, hold them accountable, but setting expectations for them. If you don't tell them, you're going to have, well, this guy remembers how his dad used to treat him. This guy remembers how his boss at McDonald's used to treat him. This one remembers, and it's going to be like a bag of marbles hit the ground and went in different directions instead of this is what we expect here. You know, train your people, you know, equip your people, motivate your people, lead your people, take care of your people, protect your people, blah, 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 all those different things we talk about. And if I see where you're lacking, I'll coach you on that and we'll talk about it later. Yeah. So do you, and, and for me, I, the, the, I know, I know for, Swedish fire service is, is um, very good and very bad, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> different things. But one thing that we're really bad at, we, it's, it's a culture thing in Sweden. So like the mentor coach thing, and uh, so the mentor, the mentor mentee or the mentor student uh, relationship isn't really there. We have a, we have a high, high we're afraid of hierarchies. We have a, an authority problem. It's, I think it's a left over from socialism, communism, where everybody would be equal. So it, it's, there's, there's still, it's still a stigma of, 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 of any hierarchies. Like we are we're very low on having insignias and, and, you know, like very fancy uniforms because it's a sign of you're better than me and you're not. Like it, it, it makes it very hard to create reward systems also, and it, and it also create it makes it hard to to create pride in what you do because there's very hard it's very hard to recognize things in certain ways. Uh, so I think we have a huge journey to do, and a lot of learn from America and other countries that are much better working with with those kind on an individual level, like mentor systems, and but also right. like systematically. Um, I, I know you need to go soon, but, but I also wanted to, to, to talk about, because you, now you work in a volunteer fire service and volunteers basic doesn't exist in Sweden. Everybody's paid either part-time or full-time. Um, uh, and it's sort of been the assumption that 
in Sweden that nobody would do this for free. It's become a job, which is also tied with the lack of, of right and ownership that I think is reviving in Sweden. They're like, we are not as good as we think we are. We, we need to step up. This is not just a job. It is really a, a something else. I, th I sense there's a revival, but when I was exposed to the world, when most of the world are volunteers and they would do everything for free, it was sort of like a, you know, a punch in the face. Also, both in my understanding of the human psyche <laughs> and motivation as a whole. Um, but how do you think money should be seen when we talk about motivation? Well, I mean, you know, if you get back to, like I said, Maslow, Maslow's motivational pyramid and hierarchy needs, you know, money, money is what pays the bills. Money is what, how you feed your family. Money is, you know, how you provide transportation. Money is your lifestyle. It's how you're going to live the rest of your life, how you're going to retire, all those things. So it's critical that people understand that, you know, there needs to be a career in your life that provides for that means. You know, people need that security that they know they can feed their family themselves and so on and so forth. But I think I think volunteerism has been around for thousands of years, whether it's whether it's in the military, whether it's in your local community, whether it's with your local church, with your local school. You know, the volunteerism has been there in the States. Goodness gracious. And Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and Little League Baseball and softball and football and in your churches and in your homeowners associations, volunteerism has been there a long time. Uh, the volunteer fire service in the States, when Ben Franklin created it in 1736, you know, was an appeal that we needed, we need to do something. Instead of just people running amok when things catch fire and pulling stuff down, we need to have a system that, that has some checks and balances as to how we're going to do things. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, money, money is a big motivator. Absolutely. It's a big motivator. Um, you know, I, I just, first of all, I could believe when I got to be a career firefighter that they had, because I was a volunteer, I was a junior all through high school, I was a volunteer, I was 18 years old. When I got to be a career firefighter, I was a police officer for a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, I couldn't believe they were actually, actually paying me to be a firefighter. <laughs> I was like, I get paid to do this? We have all the best toys and we have all the best stuff. This is like, really, I get paid for this? So sometimes you got to remind people that I do, there are some people that get to it just because of the job. You know what? I could have been a bus driver. I could have been a truck driver. I could have been a school teacher. I could work, you know what? I decided to be the fire. I like to shift all that stuff, whatever. I think the first time someone's little kid looked up at you and said, I want my mommy or my daddy, you knew why you were doing this. Hopefully you knew why you were doing this. Um, but volunteerism has been around for a long time. I, I volunteered then. I volunteer now. I I'll, 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 as long as I can do it, I'll keep doing it. Um, I want to have an impact on my community. I want to be able to share my experiences. Um, you know, so, you know, it's, it's uh, let me see, just under 40,000 fire departments in the United States, uh, about 1.2 million firefighters, 62% of it all is volunteer. So there's still... You know, there there will never be a completely career paid fire service in the United States because there are there are areas, counties, and jurisdictions that don't have enough money. <coughs> excuse me, for a part time firefighter, let alone a whole fire department. So they have to rely on their volunteers. So I think it takes something very special to be a volunteer to dedicate your time. You know spend your own money in a lot of cases and do things, leave your family in the middle of the night, all different times to go and fight fires or help people in your community. I think there's also an incredible feeling that goes along with that. But, uh, uh, you know, the volunteerism here is, is you know, it has, it, people talk about the challenges between, behind get, getting people to sign as volunteers. And it, it has always been a national crisis. But I remember it was that way when I was a kid, when my dad was a volunteer firefighter, that they had people quitting and joining and quitting and joining and different things going on then. Um, uh, it is a little bit different now because it's harder to get some people to actually commit to the life of volunteering or doing it. Again, I don't think we recruit people the right way. You know, uh, you can't go to old people's social media, Facebook, and expect young people to see your ad that you're looking for people. Uh, you know, you've got to be creative. You've got to know where to go. You've got to go to the churches. You have to go to the schools. You have to go to the college, you know, the, the sports programs. You have to go to the social media thing that all 
the young people are doing now and appeal to them and find ways. You know, like we start off talking about the show, you know, a lot of people want to be able to, I want to be able to work out and hear this and then get back to what I was doing. I, I want to be able, you know, they like the short videos and short clips. You know, you got to know which social media streams to hit to to go after people and know what what, what appeals to them. You know, if but if people are going to, if they're going to think that they're going to, you know, hire people as volunteer firefighters now, they'd be the same they did in the 50s. It doesn't work that way anymore. In fact, nobody's like they were in the 1950s. You know, our whole society has yeah. changed. So you need to kind of jump in, you know, you know, Doc Brown's, uh, DeLorean from back to the future and you need to come back to the future and go, okay, this is where we're at now and things have changed and figure out how to make it work. Well, obviously it is possible to create a fire service that is highly dedicated and nobody gets paid. That is obvious because those like fire services exist. Uh, now, if I look at some of those departments who seem to exist here and there, look South America and so on, you find them that that they they need to solve their money problem somewhere else, of course. So the right. fire service has to be really flexible at accommodating people, which I don't think it seems like a lot of departments are willing or has have been forced to be. Uh, as flexible in the past. Like in Sweden, it's it's joined us so that it's hard to find part-time firefighters. You, you pay them, but it's still hard to find part-time firefighters because the fire service has has has, has ridden on a on a culture and a and a and history where people wanted to join the fire service really badly. And one one way to join the fire service was far, first join as a part-time and then work a couple of years and then you, you you get hired full time for instance now that system sort of changed and then you took away one of the reasons to become a part time firefighter and also now uh, it's very much harder because people have to travel more for work it was it, people usually don't don't live at the same time with the work and so on so i think that the fire services for the for the volunteers i guess flexibility it's a super important word and Sweden has not, according to me anyway, been willing to really, really make that leap because the incentives are really not there. I would say if I'm going to be like honest, from my point of view, the fire chiefs don't really care if they get enough well, part-time firefighters, because what happens if they don't get enough part-time is that the politicians remake it into like a half full-time. Okay, what well, was the penalty for the fire chief? Oh, I got a bigger budget, more staff, more full time. I can do more. Like it's just ups. It's just ups. Um, and and the fire service as a whole, the part time, full time, nobody's really incentivized to hunt for volunteers because they're competing with their job security. Right, right. And I see this since we don't have really have that in Sweden. It's it's sort of like I I see that as it would be hindered, but I, but the outright fights when i go to some countries and so on the enormous amount of hostility between full-time and volunteer could be mind-boggling right uh because of the volunteers see themselves as providing a service they're doing good they see themselves as valuable and the professionals see them just as a liability you're not good and they don't think they're good and you are messing with my job Right. Uh, and do you, th is that an issue in America or do you think America has find like a, generally like a balance between professional and volunteerism and culture wise? And well, it, it's definitely a problem. I mean, it always has been. Um, I don't think it's as dramatic as people make it out to be. Um, uh, you know, but it is an issue. Uh, I'm familiar with a career fire department uh, not too far from me that hates volunteers. Uh, not all of them, but the majority absolutely despise. And I, when I say hate, I mean the actual word hate volunteers. Um, I'm not a big believer in taking jobs away from people. Um, I've never been a big believer as much as I'm very pro volunteer. There's a couple of cities out there where they had, you know, there's one city on the northwest side of Chicago that used to be covered by the city of Chicago and decided to go through a fire department. They have enough money 
to create like 50 fire departments if they wanted to. But they chose to go to contract service, which charges about third less, and they were all contracts. So if you want to be a fire chief, forget that because you know, there's no, it was just, I don't believe in that. That, that you know, I, I don't like that part of it. You know, that was their way of being very controlling yeah. and being able to say, we don't like. On the other hand, like I said, there are places where they will never have, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So why is someone not allowed to drive back from, you know, drive home an hour, two hours from their career job and volunteer in a community and protect those they go to church with and those that their neighbors and stuff in a town that will never have, never ever in a, in a million years have a career fire department. So yeah, there, there are issues here. There are people, there are, you know, the, the, I'm very pro labor. I'm very pro volunteer, you know, um, but there are some on the labor side that actually despise it. And there's some volunteers that hate the, the career guy. There, there's, there's always been this and I don't think that's going away anytime soon. But yeah, this, this same things exist. It's like, you're going to take my job from me. You hear a lot of young firefighters who hear the old firefighters say stuff and they repeat it. And it's not really accurate, but I have a problem with those that, that, like I said, could have their own fire departments and choose not to, or, you know, and, and in doing so, what I'm saying is they hire a contract service. If you decide to stay volunteer, that's fine with you. If you, if you got enough money, to be a career city and you choose to remain with your volunteers because they're dependable and they're loyal. And all that, God bless you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the city that moves to go from coverage from like the city of Chicago to their own fire department and chooses to just contract people instead of hiring and letting people develop and create a whole, you know, cause that that's yeah. the, the easy way out for them. And it's very controlling. There are, there are some cities that, you know, do have the money and the means to be a career fire department. But like I said, they've got tremendous volunteers that do a great job. They're very dependable. There's no slow response times and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think sometimes we get a little, we, we rule with emotion instead of common sense. And I think everybody needs to look at their situation, and figure things out, you know. And I, I think there is a place for both uh, in, in, in the fire service. Do you see that? Let's say, when a, just, when a volunteer firefighter or a whole department becomes career, that they lose their sense of purpose in the same way in a, some years. Like as a no, volunteer, no. it's it's very easy to like to see the purpose of what you're doing. You you're making a commitment, and that's value in that personally. Yeah, but I see some volunteers, you know, I know what you're saying, but I see some volunteers that don't give a shit either. I mean, I'm just sorry. They just, they did it for the t-shirt. They did it so they could say they're about <laughs> yeah. stick around their truck and they're, they're yeah. not committed. They're not, they're not, they're not into it all. Yeah. I think, I think it's both ways. What I do see happen is, and this I've always said, look, I don't care if you know, most, most career guys, not all, but most career guys and gals started as volunteers, not all of them, but most did. Okay. So when you get your career job, if you decide not to volunteer anymore, God bless, God bless you. Thank you mm -hmm. for what you did. But but don't turn around and M and F or dis volunteer firefighters. You know that you know that you don't dis your heritage. I mean that's who gave you your start. I'm not saying you have to volunteer for the rest of your life, but don't turn around and call them names and say things because that's how you ended up here. You know. Uh, but I, but I've, I as much as there's some career guys that treat just as a job, they're not into it. I know some volunteers. I'm like, I don't even know why you're here, man. You don't show up for calls. You don't do this. You, you know, you, we call them, they're just in it for the t-shirt. That's what yeah. they did. Um, so I think it's, I think it's on both sides yeah. uh, when it comes to the love for the job or the lack of it. I just hope, I mean, it's being a professional service as a whole of, you know, everybody's paid, but I see it as like how we, of course, people need money to solve all their problems in life. So you need money. I am very supportive of people having money, but it's like I see that there's this this. It's very easy for someone who gets employed, and if the culture is it's just a job, now I'm getting paid. It's just a job, and if the expectation of the fire service is too low, we're not good at setting expectations. Then I see this disconnect, disconnect that that we lose a lot of that engagement they had as a volunteer. Because then they had another drive. It was it. Was, they were not there for the money. They were there because they thought it was fun. It was rewarding. It was challenging. It also, maybe for the t-shirt. Uh, so so, I, like how, how do you 
maintain that? Is is there a, like how do you make sure that when you pick someone up from a pride who had that kind of drive, make sure you don't lose it? Is not it's not as much the money as it is working for a crappy boss drives them away from that. So I think a lot of the motivation comes back to the, those people of, you know, um, get people in the job, remind them there's little boys and girls and little grandmas and grandpas out there that are counting on us. And and I've always appealed to, do you like your mom or your dad? Well, of course I do, Chief Lasky. Then how do you want, yeah, here it is, you want it? That's the fire department at your mom's house. How do you want that firefighter to treat your mom? There's your answer. If you're okay, if you're, I say, who's here? Raise your hand. I always say, who's here? in this audience that's okay with some firefighter come to their house and treat their mom or dad, their grandma, or grandpa, or their son or daughter like crap. Raise your hand if you're okay with that. And nobody ever raises their hands. I said, then why do you allow it? Why do you permit people to, 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 to treat people that way? Well, it's kind of the same thing as a boss. You know what? You know, you have an obligation to keep your people motivated, keep them into the job and all that's what good leaders do. You know, good leaders do that at whatever the business is, you know, find a purpose and you'll find your passion and that doesn't happen when you have crap leading the way. You know, the, the bosses that are sitting here have to be those who have their hand in that morale crank and keep it going. We have a lot of managers. Like we have, if, if there's a difference between a manager and a leader, like we have a oh, lot of, we, we have a lot of managers of fire services. They, they run the fire service system uh, and to make sure that there's enough people in the boots uh, but we don't have a lot of leaders, I would say, because I would say one of the reasons is that our our uh, the education system to become fire chief in Sweden is that you're a fire protection engineer and you and you you're going laterally, typically. So most fire chiefs don't come up through the ranks; they they come in laterally. They've never been a firefighter, for instance. Uh, and then I don't think that that's necessarily a problem. I think that's a challenge. I think that there's there's benefits and drawbacks about of doing it that way. But they're they're engineers. They're not people persons typically. They're not there because they wanted to be great leaders. They're there because right. it was a there was a there was something with the fire service that was sort of rewarding, you know, also, you know, the, the badge was part of it probably, like, but they wanted a different role. They didn't didn't want to be firefighters, they want to have a you know more status, they want to have a different type of job. So they're engineers, most of them. And and they're like systems and bolts. They want to have a good system. They're not leaders in the way that I think that would you say they're not cranking the motivation board. <laughs> right. Managers um, manage stuff. Leaders lead people. Managers enforce rules. Leaders promote values. Yeah. And you've got to be good at both of those to be good as, as a boss out there. But, you know, managers manage stuff. You can't talk, talk about titles. You know, that's what your management. That's what you do. You manage stuff, but you lead people. You supervise people. You supervise operation of people, you manage stuff, and the, the the final outcome is what kind of leader that makes you. So yeah, so so do you think so you talked about officers in, in America typically you don't get any officer training. Back in the day in Sweden, officers class included actually leadership. But it was for budget reasons slowly eroded away. And now it's just basically the operational duties you you are taught. In, in officer's class and the leadership issue kind of gone away. Um, do you think that leadership training in America is, is in a decline or do you think that like, like, or is it, is it, is that a valuable uh, asset or a thing that, that fire service trying to bring back leadership training, at least trying to get better leaders? I don't, I don't think it's in a decline. Um, I don't think it's obviously it's nowhere where it should be. Um, uh, we, that's because we teach it and we know the, re the request for programs we get and we yeah. get people from all over that go, nothing is offered like what this is. You know, that's, that was one of our reasons for my buddy, John Salk and I doing what we're doing is because nobody was getting it. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's under the decline, but I don't think it's, I, I think it's kind of uchin, but it's not anywhere where it should be, but it's definitely not a decline, but it's, it's, a uh, it's better than it was in the old days when there was absolutely nothing out there. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some great people teach some great stuff, but it's definitely not where it should be. So whose fault is that? Because most of the things, most of the fire service, it's other fire officers. You think it's the problem of they don't recognize what their departments need? 
But the, I think it's a leadership issue. If the leaders are okay with mediocre officers, if the leaders are okay with people that don't know how to do their jobs, if the leaders are okay with the people who are supposed to be taking care of the folks on at, at the firehouses that don't even know what they're doing, then there's a problem. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 we're casting people out there and hoping they do well instead of providing them with the tools to be good company officers and and be out there with their people making things happen. I think it all comes down to the leadership. It all comes down to who's run the show. And there are a lot of chiefs cave cave into political pressure from from city halls and you know I know budgets are budget driven, but you know what? You don't have to necessarily have a budget to do you don't, you don't have to have a budget to do leadership training. You have to do leadership training to your people. You have to hire somebody from the outside. You have to find a means to do it inside, station to station, shift to shift, whatever you're doing, however you have to do it. If you can train your people other stuff, you can train them on how to be good leaders. All right. It, the, the excuse of we just don't have the means kind of just trickles down and, and is out into the the, 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 the stream. Um, I think it comes down to the leadership. If you want better bosses, then you need to find the means to be able to do it, whether it's internally or externally, you know. But I mean, you can't expect it. That's like expecting somebody to walk in, put a fire uniform on and never send to the fire academy, perform well as firefighters. You know, that, that you want to talk about the old days. Let's just show up at a firehouse as a volunteer and go running into a burning building. And never, you know, I mean, that, that I, I think that's ludicrous. I think that's absolutely insane to think that a, a brand new person is going to perform well as a firefighter without the training. What about as a company officer, Lieutenant, you know, cap, that person that's that's overseeing. Yeah. If we're not giving them the tools, it's not voodoo. It's not magical. They're not going to get it. We've got to give it to them. And I, a lot of fire chiefs, God bless them, but there's a lot, lot out there that need to wake up and take care of their people a little better and provide their their the people that are running their shows for them the instruments to be better. And one of the reasons I became a, I'm an instructor was because of scalability. I, I I can influence more people as an instructor as a fire uh, uh, or compared to as a firefighter. As I can scale and and as an organization, we look at well, leadership is a scalable thing, like. A, a small input here would get a great output if the leadership is done right. So I, I would think it's a, it's a bang for buck thing to to value. Uh, and I also, like you said, I, I I probably would have said that leadership is 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 innate like a trait in people. But looking at how much I have changed, depend on on, on inputs rather than what I've done, like reading, just listening to people, everything, have given me so tremendous amount of tools. That I, I would be a better leader than right. I would be without them. It, no questions asked. So, so you, it's, it is possible, of course, to improve. Now, do you think it's a part of it is uh, like, you know, what the saying is if it's not measured, it doesn't get done? Like, leadership is hard to measure. Like, like it's hard to, it, I can't, if I'm a fire chief, I can't look at the neighboring department and say, my leadership is five points better than yours. And therefore I'm doing good or bad. Like, how do you, how do you motive, how do you justify, for instance, like expense into leadership? Like, is there a way of, is there a way of looking at leadership as, as, as something that's been able to measure or quantify or. Uh, you know, I mean, one way is through your performance evaluations, but you're talking about individuals there. So, you know, performance evaluations are based on the core competencies that come out of the job description for that particular position that you're evaluating. And if your job description is written right, right, and the core competencies that you're evaluating people on match the job description, that's one mechanism. But if you're, and I'll go back to, if you're not going to invest in your people, I think it's an investment. If you're not going to invest in your people, and again, we're talking people. You want to treat people like machines, machines break down. All right. Machines break up. People are people and people progress at different speeds and different levels all the time and so on and so forth. Uh, I think you need to have an evaluation process that's valid and good. A lot of people's performance evaluations stink because they, they don't train their people to do them. They're not valid. They have core competencies. They're evaluating people that aren't even in the job description. I can evaluate somebody on, some, somebody on something that's not even in their job description. Uh, but I, I think it's hard. It's hard to compare different fire departments to different fire departments because, you know, some people say a company officer is a company officer and you should be great whether you have great stuff or crappy stuff. You know, it's easy to get a lot of stuff done when you got a fantastic training facility, you've got all these things. 
you have to be a little more creative when you don't have that and you want to deliver some information and mentor your people. Um, but uh, again, uh, I think if you don't invest in your people, if you don't invest in the system, uh, I think that's what it comes down to. But it's always been very difficult. Um, you know, the military, you know, they, they say they're good at, they're really not that good at about you, you promote, you promote, you do this, you do that. They evaluate you. And, and if you're a staff sergeant, every staff sergeant, well, that, I've met them. Not every staff, we do a lot of talk, talks with our forces. Not every gunnery sergeant is the same as the other gunnery sergeants. You know, they, there's a minimum you hit. And then from there, you're going to see some gunnies that are incredible and some that are not so good. But I don't think there's, I, I, I think it'd be difficult to have one mechanism out there on how to, uh, you know, I've been a big one in quality, not quantity. You know, there are some people that are trying to, they, they push so much, they wear people. I'd rather see, you know, uh, one of the best headhunters I've ever worked for, the person, you know, finding fire chiefs, is the one that said, I'm looking for a balance, Rick. You know, you give me all the skins on the walls. And I'm big. I'm, 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 I have my, my college. I'm a big, big lover and believer and alum with Columbia Southern University. I love them. They're my other family. But you have to have a balance and 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 you can have all the skins on the walls and still suck at what you do. You, you've got to take the education you get. You got to take this part and the experience. And you have to learn how to mush it all together to make the whole thing. You know, recipes are not what you serve at the dinner table. You know, the recipe is what tells you, you know, this, 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 this to make that. And, and then how much passion, how much you love you have for cooking ends up. There are people that have the best recipe in the world that still create thick, you know, so it's kind of the same thing. You know, you can have a, a thousand books for them to do and a thousand different things. If you have people that aren't into the job and aren't passionate about taking care of people, it ain't going to happen. I'm going to let you go, but uh, like if, if you were, if you were to stand in front of, like I do a lot, I, I, I train in other instructors. At least that's what I try to do. <laughs> I try to, and I try to get, provide them the tools I have for teaching fire behavior and everything, but also we inevitably slide into topics like leadership and so on, because of like, how do you motivate people and so on? What would be your, your, like pr some practical, like two practical tips for, let's say you're going to do a two hour training for your department. Like, how do you set that up? How do you prepare the training? Not, not the actual content, but like, how do you some important things to achieve to make sure that the you at least increase the odds of the firefighters actually being motivated to th thinking this is important or valuable to me. I, I would say the, the you know, it, it, it comes, there's a book that was written a while back. It's a military book, but it's a great book and it's called the mission, the men and me. And you could take that nowadays, the mission, your team, your men and women and me. The mission is, are the people out there. The moment you screwed a fire helmet to your head, you became a public servant. So let's not lose, let's not lose sight of that. Let's not lose sight of the fact that we are public servants. Whether you, you know, I don't like that. Well, you know what? That, that's what you are. If you don't like that phrase, then go somewhere else. You know, number one is we exist for those people out there, for them. Second, as a boss, all right, as a leader, it's about your people. And lastly, it's you, you know, stay in love with the job. Stay in love with what you do. The moment you start falling out of love with what you do, like I said before, you can't be great at anything you don't love. You actually you, you become a problem, you become a nuisance, you become a hindrance to what's going on. So love what you do, take care of the people around you, train your people, strive to find better ways to do things, strive to always be better, never be satisfied, never be satisfied, never be satisfied where you're at as an organization, as a fire station, as a firefighter. Um, always learn, learn, I learn something every day. The day you stop learning stuff is the day it's time to move in a diff different direction. And I think that is a good, it describes some of my development also going from trying as an instructor to value the nuts and bolts and trying to value a little bit more of the, the, the human aspect of teaching. Uh, but it's much harder. It's easier to teach them how to raise a ladder than being interested in raising the ladder. Right. That's a, that's a, that's a huge difference. Like, okay, we're going to teach them the skills. It's hard to teach passion. Yeah. It's very hard, but, but I, but I recognize that that is, that is a part of being a good instructor as well as being a good leader in other sense. Like you are, you're one of your job as an instructor is to 
make people understand why why this is valuable. And if you can't, you probably should work on maybe it isn't valuable. Like right. what are you trying to do? Maybe isn't valuable. But but you have to convince them it is valuable if that is true. Um, thank you very much, Rick. Um, oh, thank you. I I uh, I I would love to uh, get my head around some of the topics and, and pick your brain some somewhere else. I need to take to Salk also because that would be fun someday. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna think about some of the things you said, and uh, I'll. Uh, I'll try probably incorporate in some of my training, uh, uh, especially the part where I think that America as a whole is doing well, which is trying to keep the mission in focus. I think the thing that I think that that's one of the core differences between Sweden being so professional to the point that it's just a job that people forget about the mission. Um, and I think that's a thing that America as a whole has kept. But it's a struggle. It's not just about doing your job. It's about the reason why you do your job. And I think that's a very valuable lesson that you also try to bring to the table. And I want to be an advocate for that, too. <laughs> Well, I appreciate I appreciate the time. It was an honor to be be here with you. Thanks for what you do. You you do do a great job. You have a great message, and uh, I was uh, excited to be a, a small part of it today. <laughs> and I, you, you, if you do a Swedish reading on pride and ownership, I would love to to incorporate in the Swedish literature because uh, <laughs> I love that you read the book yourself. That that's very that that is super. Well, thank you. That is super rewarding. It give, brings a whole different level to the book when you do it, when you do the audiobook on because I listened to the audiobook first before I bought it, uh, the hard copy. Uh, but it's hard with English. But I would love to get more fire officers in Sweden reading Pride and Ownership because I, it would give the it, it, it's such a culture shock. Some of the things you say, even though it's just you would say common sense a lot of things, but it's such a culture shock for some Swedish fire services and officers that it would hit them in the head in a good way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe I have good, to, good. maybe I have to translate it to Swedish, but <laughs> have a, have a good day, Rick. All right, brother. Thanks, yeah. man. Be careful. Be safe. See yeah. you next time. Same to you. Bye-bye.